Now I would love to welcome to the stage both Alfredo and Angelita. Please join me in welcoming them. Uh, could you both just tell us a little bit about yourselves? Um, Angelita, let's start with you. Well, thank you for having us today. My name is Angelita Baez, and I am the program director of our advocacy and litigation program at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. My name is Alfredo Romero. I'm the executive director of Foro Penal Venezolano, which is an NGO, human rights NGO, that works in Venezuela. And we assist uh, pro bono the victims of repression in Venezuela. Great, thank you. Um, Alfredo, through your work, um, through your human rights organization, Foro Penal, you've helped over 10,000 people. Um, I, had, I had outdated data. I, I thought it was 4,000. It's actually 10,000, which is incredible. So you've helped over 10,000 people. Can you tell us a little bit about your work as it pertains to uh, the restrictions on freedom of expression? Well, yes, we have assisted more than 10,000 people because we've been working since 2002, actually. Uh, we started, um, or I started myself, uh, assisting the family of one guy. His name is Jesus, actually, or was Jesus, an 18 years old a boy who was killed. He was shot in his head. So at that time, I thought that was going to be, you know, my only case. I, th I thought, okay, I'm going to assist this guy because um, the family actually came to me. I can tell you the whole story is longer than that. But, then after that, uh, second family came to me, and the third one, and the fourth one, or whatever. And I actually thought it was going to end uh, in 2002, because uh, I, I, mean, I wasn't used to assist victims of a state repression. This guy was actually killed in a mass process, protest that happened in 2002. And well, actually, repression increased a lot. And um, so at this moment, we have assisted more than 10,000 people. I'm talking about the victims of a state repression, including people that, he, that has been arbitrarily detained. Uh, um, they're also uh, forced, disappeared, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been killed, people that have been tortured. So. And the number has increased a lot. How we help them? Well, we assist them legally, but this is legally, is, I mean, you talk about legality in Venezuela about the judicial system is something that is not, uh, I mean, it is very important for the world, it's very important for us, but for the, for a government that's actually controlled, that actually control absolutely everything. I mean, to work as a lawyer is a minimum a percentage of the work that you do. So actually we do campaigns, we do, I mean, a lot of different things in order to increase the cost of repression. That's actually what we do, more than assisting legally uh, all these victims of repression. So um, we, you know, uh, hug, I would say, the families, and we um, help everyone, uh, even the families or the friends or whatever, even looking for people that have been disappeared. So that's actually what we do. But there is a very important thing that we do uh, and I realized uh, that, that that was extremely important recently, that we registered mm -hmm. all detainees and victims of repression. And you can imagine, and then I realized that if we haven't, if we, I mean, if, if, if we weren't there, registering everything, nobody would know how many people have been detained. And this are. is very important, or where they are. And uh, that's a very important thing that we are doing right now, besides, you know, well, all things that we do mm -hmm. with victims. And can you talk a little bit about um, basically how the organization has uh, reacted in the, um, how assembly and creating awareness um, due to technology, um, how has your organization um, in the context of association and assembly um, reacted in terms of restrictions on that as well? Well, we, we live in a country that everything is being controlled. Um, um, freedom of expression, I mean, it doesn't ex exist as, uh, as you know it here in the United States and in free countries. 
So we don't have like a, an opportunity to go to the media and talk about what we do. Actually, that's something that happened until 2007. There was a very important thing that happened that they closed, the government closed a very important TV channel. Mm -hmm. uh, the name was R RCTV. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm telling you about it because that, that channel, at least I, I was able to go and and denounced what was going on and um, all the situation that was going on. Um, at this moment, it's impossible. I mean, you don't have a media that you go and talk about what is going on. And the media actually doesn't show what is going on. Um, I mean, they, they, they doesn't show when somebody's detained or when somebody's killed or when somebody's tortured, something that we do, we do it by ourselves. So what we do uh, in order to, you know, to continue working and showing people what is going on and to increase political costs with the use social media. For us, social media is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that actually, I didn't know too much about it. I started using social media in 2009. That was the first student I actually helped. He, he was the, the first student that was actually arbitrary detained. His name is Julio. And I remember just to tell you an anecdote about it, um, he was in, he was taken to the court, and the, he, this guy was at 21 years old at the time, maybe 20. He was very thin, you know, very naive, like, and, and um, he was at the doors of the court, and I took a picture of him, uh, I, you know, and, and, and it was on Twitter actually, so I, I published it in Twitter. I didn't know too much about Twitter at that time, and um, I used it, and actually the picture, I mean, the whole, all Venezuelans saw the picture, and, and they were all, you know, reacting about this student that was taken to prison, and, and it was extremely important because uh, after that, a hunger strike yeah. started of students, um, you know, claiming for the release of, of this guy, and actually he was released in 22 days. And um, so that was very important. After that, well, I've been using social media as a, as a most, I would say it's, most, it's the most important tool for increasing the cost of repression, because it's not that you can, you can um, tell it uh, mm -hmm. to, to the world like easier, because it's not that you have the media there to, I mean, the media is totally control. Even they, they control in the control by themselves or because the government's actually put pressure on them or the government just control the whole media because they have all state, uh, you know, the public, uh, the, 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 the channels that, or the media that's being controlled by the government, by the state. But so that's the way that we actually show people what is going on in the world. So this is extremely important. I mean, the way how we can um, in some way Work without without having freedom of expression, you know, the, 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 the way at least as you know how, you know how it works. Yeah, and you briefly touched on a little bit ago your work with detainees and alerting the families. Can you talk a little bit about that, what that looked like before your work and what it looks like now? Yeah, we work, I always say that we work in the darkness and solitude, so because when there is a mass protest and a lot of people are out on the streets and protesting, at least you are, you know, with your family, your friends, and all of that. And how, when we start working, well, when people are arbitrarily detained after, after the protest end, uh, end because of, uh, because of repression. So, so we go, what we do, actually, uh, people in Venezuela know Foro, they know Foro Penal, and they know that we help people that are being arbitrarily detained, but more than that, they know that the only way to know where their son or daughter or mother or father uh, is, I mean, it was taken, is to call for open house. So what we do, we, have, we are more than 4,000 volunteers right now. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, it's a very big organization. Yeah, now, what these volunteers do is not just lawyers. Lawyers, we, we are right now formed by more than 160 lawyers all around the country. But what the volunteers do, the volunteers are the ones, I mean, I'm talking the volunteers and a student, a mother or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. even volunteers are, were already victims of repression at some point, so they help for open out helping other victims. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so they go, because when you're detained, technically, in Venezuela, you're forced disappeared. I mean, you're, there, is, there are forced disappearances. So why? Because you don't know where you're being taken. It's not that you call 800 government of Venezuela and then you find out who, who, where, where your, your son is being detained or your daughter. So that's what we do, actually. We work at night uh, until the morning in order to know where these the family members are. You know, where, where the, the people, detainees. the detainees are. So the families, so the families call us and we tell the family, go to, the, to that place. So, because we have found out that this guy is in that place. So whenever we find out, for example, Pedro is in whatever place, and how we find it out? Well, because we talk to the, to the custodians there and, you know, it's not like an official thing. And I, I, so we do it like underground. So we talk to them, is this guy here, whatever. So then when you find out that this guy is there because somebody tells you that he, this guy is there, sometimes you find out that there are more, 10 others. So we start helping these people. So we tell the families. Mm -hmm. And we use Twitter, basically, or the social media to tell, okay, this guy has been detained in this place. So the families call us and come to the place and they know where they are. Wow. So, and then, you know, the whole process started. So they, some, some of them are taken to the court, some they are not. But it's more important than that because you have to provide food to these people because these people, it's not that you're being detained and you have food and water. I mean, you don't have even food and water if you're not detained. So you can imagine in Venezuela, so you can imagine if, how, if you're detained. I mean, you have to provide water, so you have to bring water, you have to bring food, you have to, um, you know, bring everything to these people that are being detained. So, but it's extremely important because, you, as I said before, you imagine if we weren't there. I mean, nobody would know where, where the detainees are. Mm -hmm. So, and we're talking just since 2014, January 2014, there have been exactly till today, 11,903 uh, people that have been uh, detained for political reasons. So, and we have a registered. Mm -hmm. and now we have a very sophisticated database. So we have registered everything, the place where they were detained, the age, the profession. I mean, we know everything, how many women have been detained. So this is a very confidential information, but you have absolutely everything. So it's not that we, when I said that there had been more than 10,000 detainees, 11,903, it's not because I'm, the media tells me, well, the media, gets information from what we tell them, mm -hmm. or what we have. So, oh, this is some of the things that we do, and um, oh, some of the things that we do. Actually, we have a, a kind of a mathematical way of analyzing the actions that we have to do in order to increase the political cost. It's a kind of interesting thing, um, because we, we, we use like a tactical plan. I mean, it's, it's not something that we do it right now, like, um, like you know, a, a, as an informal way. We do it in a very a tactical way of, you know, doing a specific thing, so we analyze it and all of that. And I'm telling you this because I, I, I was, I was uh, telling you about um, the legal assistance. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the, the number of actions that we have in order to release a person is, uh, is 40 actions, wow. 40. So the legal assistant is just one of the 40 actions of the, wow. so, so there are many. So, and social media, mm -hmm. it counts, um, the value for social media is five of the 40 wow. actions. It's that kind of, I mean, it's a very, a methodology that is longer to, I mean, it's a long explanation, but that, that's how we work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and why have you chosen to become a human rights defender when it comes at such a great risk to your life and your safety? I didn't choose to become a human rights defender. I mean, the truth is, it will sound, I don't know how it will sound, but at the beginning, I, you know, I was graduated from Catholic University, a good university in Venezuela, Jesuit University, and owned by the Jesuits. The, and, um, and then I came to Georgetown University. And I got my master's degree in Latin American Studies from the School of Foreign Service. And then I went to London School of Economics. And I got my master's degree in banking law. So I didn't <laughs> care about human rights. It's not that I didn't care. I didn't know anything about human rights. I didn't study human rights. What happened is 
what I was telling before, that in 2002, one guy was killed, he was shot in his head, 18 years old boy, his name was Jesus. His mother name was Maria. <laughs> so, um, and I was at that time an advisor to the Supreme Court of Justice, um, to the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court. And I was working as a corporate lawyer, I still work as a corporate lawyer with all the restrictions and all that. Um, so as I said, so I decided to help this guy. That's it. I, I, I thought that if I, you know, help this guy, then I will, it will finish and I will continue with my work. <laughs> but then I realized, and for example, there was a, a right now my, my friend and member of the, my NGO and also part of the board of directors, Gonzalo Imiov, who is a, also my compadre, like, mm -hmm. And uh, we started helping these people, and actually, we realized that no, there was no NGOs doing legal assistance pro bono to these people. Because I realized, I, I thought that there were a lot of NGOs helping these people. So I thought, okay, we'll help this guy, and then an, an NGO will come to, to us and, and continue with the, with the assistance of, of these people. But actually, there was Jesus, then there was another Jesus, Jan Carlos, and you know, mm -hmm. and now we have Geraldine, we have Maria, we have all these people that actually were victims of repression, and they came to us and asked for help. And um, I became a human rights defender. Mm -hmm. And actually, in 2002, I thought it was the end. And then in 2003, I thought it was the end. And 2004, it was the end, and now we're in 2017, and we are still um, helping all these people that are being tortured, like uh, with electric shocks or, um, you know, sexually abused or, or killed. Uh, like, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you many names. They are already the families of these people already. No, no, not just my friends. They are part of the for open Penal family, of my NGO family, because they have become part of, a, of For open Penal, and they are not just my friends, they're my family. And, uh, you know, a, a very interesting thing, that we, when you start helping people, you never know, I mean, you didn't want to do it, of course, okay, but then you feel like a need of helping another one. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to them, and they tell you about their story and about what is happening to them. And more, most of these people are very poor people. So they don't have, lo I mean, they don't have money to pay for a lawyer. If they would have money, they, of course, they didn't call us uh, to pay for a lawyer. So, um, so you, get into, you get involved with all these people. And when a mother of, for example, Carlo Julio Velasco, an 18 years old boy student who's right now in jail, and he has to be, um, you know, he's sick uh, and all of that, and he's there in jail. And his mother talked to you and, and, and cry, and, and then you get involved with it. So you become, to be a human rights offender and to help people, it, it had become an addiction to me. It's true. I mean, it's like an addiction. So I, I, I always, sometimes I wake up, I say, okay, I have to finish with it because I'm very tired. Because as, as I said, I work in the mornings. I mean, at very uh, late at night. And uh, I came well, to my house night, sometimes really? at 4 a.m., for example, because mm -hmm. somebody called me that he was uh, being detained. And so I go to the prison center or to the military uh, uh, you know, place where they are being detained or the police station or whatever. And, uh, and then the next day I said, I'm very tired, so I have to continue with my work, <laughs> with my regular work, mm -hmm. or I have to, you know, continue. I'm a musician also, so I, I need to play music or things like that. And I, and I realized after I sleep a little bit, I wake up and again I said, okay, I have to continue because these people are asking for help. So in the end, it's not that it's a real sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Because if it were a sacrifice, I'm totally sure that we'll stop doing it. It's actually 
a great benefit. And um, maybe I'm talking too much, but I, I will tell you another little thing. Uh, we have four principles in my organization, or what we call the four C's. The four C's because the, 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 the words start with a C in Spanish. It's constancia, which means perseverance. The second one is compromiso, which means commitment. The third one is convicción, which means conviction. And the fourth one, and the most important one, is corazón, which means heart. Mm -hmm. This is a very important one because I, it's not just a beautiful word. It has a meaning, but the, everyone, but, and I explain to everyone what is the meaning, but the last one is very important because I explained and I said, what means corazón or heart? It's not just love, a romantic word. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. It means that when you do good things to people, you will receive good things to you. And actually, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing, and I, and, and I have a great family, a, lo a lovely, fla <coughs> lovely family, uh, nice sons, and, and they appreciate what I do. And this is just, the family is very important for me, but have very, well, this award term, receiving, uh, it's not usual that you receive awards like mm -hmm. that, so it's very important. But more than that is that you feel very nice helping people. Mm -hmm. And this is something that really, Everyone has to feel it because, it, as I said, it's a very great indemnification to your life and to your, you know, to you. Absolutely. So it sounds like one thing that you thought, or one incident you thought was just going to be the one-time thing, turned into this whole, yeah. you know, series of events that yeah. basically found you. Yeah, I get out of my comfort zone, and I thought that I would come back and. Yeah, now I'm You're still, comfortable still that, yeah. with, with, with what I'm doing. So this is like, right now it's my comfort zone to be, come, to be a human rights defender. I, I don't see myself doing something different, even though that I can, I mean, I have to, because to be a human rights defender is not something that actually you have, you have at least an economic uh, yeah. indemnific indemnification, but yeah. um, so you have to continue working. And this is something that I always say, say to human rights defenders. If we want to become a human rights defenders, think about doing it because it's not that you will uh, receive a payment for that. So mm -hmm. you have to continue working in what you do and, and try to finance yourself. And, um, uh, but as I said, I always say that whenever I help people, I will always receive something uh, better from, from life. That's a perfect segue um, to Angelita. Angelita, can you tell us a little bit about Partners for Human Rights and how your partnership with Alfredo came to be? So my organization, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, has been giving every year, for, this is the 34th year that we give uh, this uh, annual Human Rights Award that is, was created to recognize people like Alfredo, you know, the most courageous human rights offenders from around the world. and. Um, the program that I, I, I direct is precisely a, a support program within our organization for those that win the award. Um, the award is not only a recognition, uh, it's also our offering as an organization to Alfredo and his organization to really provide all the support we can, all the tools we use, uh, you know, or expertise, or human resources, or contacts, or ideas to help um, uh, amplify the voice of, of Alfredo and Foro Penal as well as, as, as the network of, of laureates that, that we have. Um, and that's, that's what we hope to, to, to be able to from now on continue working very much hand in hand with, with Alfredo and Foro Penal, uh, knowing that Venezuela right now really needs the international attention and the support from, from people all around the world. Uh, to put an end to this, this situation and this crisis. And one of the areas that, as an organization, we've been focusing more and more is the protection of civic space, and uh, f including, of course, the, the basic freedoms that make civic space possible, freedom of expression, freedom of association and assembly. And by partnering with courageous human rights defenders like Alfredo, we try to protect those basic uh, rights because in helping those that are at the front line, like Alfredo, putting their lives at risk, their reputation, you know, Alfredo, he didn't say so, but he's attacked constantly by, by government and by sectors of society that 
uh, don't like him being uh, supportive of those that are being, uh, whose rights are being violated. Mm -hmm. And by partnering with Alfredo and Foro Pena Venezolano, we're trying to, to lend our support and, and, and extend our hand to uh, organizations that really are uh, in, in, in the day to day trying to protect the most important and basic freedoms that we all need. Um, to really be able to participate and to express ourselves and, 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 and you know, have even to the people that have been detained, sometimes they're just protesting for the basic right of, of having food on their table, of being able to work or being able to disagree with the government. Mm -hmm. And those rights are being completely curtailed. So again, we, we aim at um, supporting organizations that are doing incredible work, just like Foro Penal Venezolano, and protect that space that is so important and those basic freedoms, such as <coughs> expression and, and assembly and association. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we're in a very interesting time right now where there are a lot of causes that could use support. <coughs> um, and so what was it specifically? Because I, I know that there were thousands of applicants. What was it about Alfredo and his specific organization that led to the selection of the 2017 uh, Robert F. Kennedy Foundation Human Rights Award? Many reasons. Um, Alfredo was definitely the... the very clear and, and a unanimous decision by the, the jury. We have an external jury that chooses the, <coughs> each year the, the laureate. And with Alfredo, we saw somebody that is courageous, that has been able to choose a different path and having had a different career, has made and you know, has received the calling of, of being a human rights defender and has um, you know, really fell through with it. And, um, we, we also saw and, and see that, that um, ability and, and the, to take, it's like the methodology that is used by, by Alfredo and the Foro Penal Venezolano, this um, idea of really creating a network, um, lending support that goes beyond just the legal assistance, but also attends to all the other aspects of, of and needs of victims of human rights violations. So it's a very integral approach, mm -hmm. and it involves people uh, and, and you know victims and families of victims and and society at large. So that was one one of the many special things that that Alfredo has and his leadership, and also um, you know using the, the, even though there is no independence of, of the judiciary and um, the, the the government has absolute control over everything. Foro Penal and Alfredo have not entirely given up on the rule of law and on the need to use the law to defend the basic human rights of people, but at the same time also use all these other creative ways, including social media, to try to get the mm -hmm. message out. So that's another reason why we thought um, Alfredo really embodied um, uh, the courage and the creativity and the perseverance that we, we look to recognize with the Human Rights Award. So we've touched on technology a few times today and the use of social media to create awareness on what's going on, to notify family members, and to even just get the word out. Um, so last week there was a law passed uh, that gives print prison sentences up to 20 years if uh, a, a post or if something uh, on broadcast television or on the radio is deemed as hateful. Um, you know, in the wake of that recent that recent law, how can technology still be used as uh, something that can help your organization and um, as a human rights defender in general? Well, um, and I guess also the impact. We have we have, have always to, I won't say fight, but we have to have all these obstacles since we started. Um, this is a law that actually restricts severely this kind of expressions, which are just expressions, I would say expressions or messages or whatever, yeah, against the government, because the government is the one who violates uh, human rights. We abuse people. Um, the problem of this law, I mean, they call it um, a law against hate or against. Mm -hmm. um, but what the problem is that they don't even explain 
what does it mean? I mean, what is a, a message that actually, uh, you know, is included in this law and it, it, it will be sanctioned um, or criminalized, you don't know. So it's very, uh, it's on the government discretion why, when is a message against the law or not. That's a big problem. But this is a law, a new law, but they already have been detaining people for Twitter messages. Right now, for example, there is a guy called, his name is Victor Ugas, for example. This guy's been in jail for more than three years just because of a Twitter message. Um, there is another guy called Lionel Sanchez. He was in, in, he's still in jail because of that. There have been more than nine people because of social media, using social media. Um, and they come to your house and they take you out of your house uh, because, well, they can find out where, where mm -hmm. you have sent the message. So uh, the important thing is that the whole world knows about it and, and they understand that they're using these laws in order to, you know, officialized or legalized in some way in a, of, to formalize, I would say. Uh, political persecution. But this is something that we are used to it. And, um, and well, we have to continue doing our job in the very objective and, and, um, and the way that we're doing, that we're just telling the truth. And uh, of course, for the government, nobody, that's why they, they restrict all mm -hmm. media on all freedom of expression, because they don't want the truth to be known all around the world. So that's why. It is extremely important to be here. And for example, uh, I would say these companies like Google or, or international companies that have access to, I would say, to people and that they can tell the truth. I, I hope that they can help countries like Venezuela that we are always more and more restricted. And, and sometimes this is important because <laughs> I'm totally sure that if you live here in the United States or in a free country, you will say, well, come on, why these people are stupid, you know? Why, why these people can be controlled by a guy or two guys? Why they don't protest? Why they don't do things like that? Uh, why they don't just go out of the street? Oh, <laughs> people have gone out of the street many times, but they have been killed, they have been tortured. And when your son is being killed at 16 years old, 15 years old, for example, Luis Guillermo Espinosa guy, a, a 15 years old boy that was killed, then you think twice before going out of, uh, out of three. So, so this is important to understand because, um, and this is also a very important thing to understand, you cannot take freedom for granted if you live in a free country because you never know when you're gonna lose it. I used to live in a free country. I didn't know, I didn't even imagine that I would be involved in these issues. Uh, I didn't even imagine that I would become a human rights defender. I didn't imagine I would be here at some point in my life. It's not you know, something I was looking for. But um, what it happened. And um, that's why it's important um, for the whole world to know and you know, for the people to to be some kind of interested in in, in human rights and and in human rights abuses. And um, in thinking about your partnership together with uh, the Ro the Robert F Kennedy Foundation, I guess in, in thinking of the year ahead, um, what's your vision between this partnership and even the organization? Okay. <laughs> My vision. Well, well, for both of you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, uh, as we have been growing uh, for Openal uh, very much. Uh, we're more, as I said, more than 4,000 volunteers at this moment. Uh, but we are in Venezuela. Uh, it is important to what he called to inter internationalize uh, for Openal and the, the, and the message. And uh, it, it, not just the message, the method, the methodology that we used in order to increase the cost of political, of, of state repression. And I think this partnership, um, 
uh, I have to find out how we will work together. Yeah. <laughs> well, we uh, but, but I know that, that uh, it is extremely important um, to have a, a, an NGO, an organization, an independent one, that can um, actually help in, uh, you know, pu put in the message, mm -hmm. you know, on, in, 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 you know, in the place where, where it needs to be, you know, put. And so the way that uh, we need everyone to know what is going on and, and you know, make people interested in, in what is going on. And actually, for our, even for our safety in some, in some place, in some way, because uh, when you, as I said, we work there, in, like in the darkness. And if you talk about Venezuela, maybe you will think, well, first of all, where is Venezuela? <laughs> in South America, okay, let me see. Okay, and what is happening there? I mean, yeah. So, well, there is a guy whose name is Alfredo Romero with an organization that's working uh, assisting uh, victims of the state repression. So people have been killed, people have been tortured. Well, there is an organization here in the United States that actually can, in some way, uh, speak or, or louder and, yeah. and say that this is going on. And in, in case something happened to us, then we have someone here that is at, at least putting attention uh, of what is going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's a privilege and it's an honor, and we're really, um, uh, truthfully, very, very um, eager to help as much as, as we can, including that there's many tools. One of them, of course, it's what, you know, all the advocacy work, international advocacy that we can, we can do around the work that, and what, what is going on in Venezuela, and, and the work that Foro Penal is doing. Um, we also do international litigation. We bring cases, like emblematic cases, that uh, before international tribunals, where um, cases that are representative of a wider, larger problem. And uh, for example, the law, the recent law that was passed in Venezuela, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting because it's just an example of one of the tactics that more and more countries are using, repressive countries, where social media was like another frontier that was not, mm -hmm. It was completely out of control for repressive governments, and so and it's so they, new also. And it's so yeah. new, so they're really by adopting these type of laws, they're trying to also control that, and um, and so it's it's you know there's a lot of things to do there, even to try to combat these laws. But there's there's many aspects of the work that and the tools that that we can use together, um, including with international mechanisms and targeted advocacy that, that we really look forward to, to work together on and just put the message out and uh, continue calling the attention of, of, of the world and what's going on in Venezuela. So I have one more question before I open it up to Q&A. Um, so for the people here, for the people that will watch this, uh, for anybody that's interested, how can people help? How can people get involved? Um, you know, being in the United States, what can you do? What can you do to help? We incorporate everyone to our network. So everyone can be part, can be a member of Foro Penal. So they can register at foropenal.com. And actually, this is extreme, very important because it's what I say. Even if you work one minute a month as a volunteer, Doing a, you know, saying something about what is going on. Even if you just work two hours, um, I don't know, participating in, a, in a, an assembly or, or in a forum that we do, it is extremely important. So, um, as I said, everyone is important here. I mean, and we train people to become part of our organization. So. That's a very important thing, because if, if, if you are registered in our organization, then we, we know where you are, and we can some way uh, send information. And, and Because it's, uh, um, I mean, it's extremely important to understand what is going on. This is the most important thing. How you, I would say, not translate it in, you know, the, just, not just the language. It's how to make people understand. Uh, what, what does it mean to live in a country that the freedom has been uh, lost? Mm -hmm. Even uh, children. I mean, we incorporate 14 years old uh, 
boys or girls, because, and I listen to them. Is this extreme? Well, I always say that in order for anyone to understand what you say, you have to talk to a 13 years old boy. That's the only way that you have to, that people can understand what you're saying. It's difficult, but it is important. So that's the way, the best way to, to, to support what we do. Um, and um, for example, as you know, I'm, I'm not talking about lawyers, of course, not just students or, or intellectuals. I'm talking about as singers, about artists, about, mm -hmm. you know, this is- Using your platform. Every, no, but everything is yeah. extremely important. I use, for example, music. I'm a musician, so I use music in order to sing and sometimes to explain what I'm doing with a, with a song. And when, whenever I, for example, I publish a song either in YouTube or whatever, singing, uh, yeah, I will get more views than just talking about state repression and ex you know all technicalities of this or people that are being tortured or whatever. So everyone can help. Just I always ask people to register to become part of our organization, and I'm sure that uh, they will do something very good for for people in Venezuela and also all around the world where where governments and um, dictators actually have the control of, of people and, and needs to control people with repression in order to, to keep in power. And if I may add, since we're in Google, and Google is known for having some of the most talented uh, people on the technical field, the communications field, I think that putting that talent also and getting coming up with ideas, particularly on, when it comes to getting the message out, um, security is also a big thing, not only for you know Fred, but all the people in the network. What they're doing, what Photo Penal is doing, is documenting human rights abuses. That comes at high risk. So anything that can help do that work at, in a safer way, in a more secure way, in a more mainstream way, um, it's it's always going to be welcome in Venezuela and, and, and in other places in the world. Where, uh, uh, but in, in the specific case of Venezuela, especially now with the additional challenges that are um, being created by the government to mm -hmm. really disseminate information, that's also something where uh, these, the brains that we have here, I'm sure, can be very, very useful. You know, just very quick, there, there was um, also another story, um, very interesting in order to understand how, for example, people in the world can help. And again, telling what is going on and to increasing the cost of political repression, uh, the, the, the political cost of repression. Just uh, once, about one year ago, there was um, a woman that was uh, detained. Uh, she was protesting or whatever. And uh, she was, um, she was, her name uh, was Jocelyn. So she was detained actually, and she was taken to a, to a military base and this guy, from what she told me, uh, this military officer was starting, started touching her. And she was with her, like, in, a, in an office, in his office. And somebody started knocking the, at the door. There was a soldier or whatever. And, and this guy just stand up very quick and stop touching her. And then the guy came back to the office and start yelling and took her and threw her to whatever place, I don't know. And she said, who are you? Why? Well, because the social media is with your picture and with your name and everything. And we were the ones who were actually uh, publishing uh, pictures of her and, their and her name. And so this is extremely important. So, so this is the only way. Sometimes you can, and I'm, I'm totally sure, and she says that, that we help her. I mean, if, if, we, if we weren't there publishing the pictures, I'm, so, I'm sure she will be um, raped. So um, it's extremely important. I mean, just if you mention something in a social media network or whatever, it could, it could save a life. So uh, that's how you can help. For example, I, I, I will give you another idea, something that I, I don't care because whoever can do it, and Google is the place. For example, I always have thought on a map 
of victims of repression in the world. So there is not a map. So how many political prisoners are in the world? Nobody knows it. I know it in my country because we have a register. So it's important to know where are the victims of repression all around there. So people can actually put their names so the, the whole world knows there is like a map. So something's happening here, something's happening there. And mm -hmm. Google is a great platform <laughs> to do that. So now I want to open it up for questions. Does anyone, um, does anyone have any questions? You can line up on either side. Oh. We can start with you on the left. Sure. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for everything. Uh, so at Google, we're also a data-driven company, and I see you're looking a lot at your, at your data. I'm just curious, ha have you seen trends, I mean, with number of cases, number of repressions, and things like that? Has it changed? or? Has it only gone up, or has there been any change? I mean, I'm, I'm interested about that. Yeah, this is this is a very important uh, question. Again, we how we work or how I analyze everything. I analyze it as a as a cost, as a political cost benefit analysis. That's it of repression. So, we are the organization that actually shows the list of political prisoners in Venezuela. Just to give you an idea. So. They use what I have called the revolving door effect. So when they incarcerate some and they release an others, and they incarcerate and they release an others. So I, I, I always said that there have been more than, well, 11,900, whatever, political detainees. But so they're being affected. I mean, the, the intimidation effect is really important. So everyone is being intimidated, so everyone is a victim. So she told me that uh, one of her, of her families was a victim, so they called us. And you can see all Venezuelans all around the world even uh, telling me the same thing. So in order to increase the political cost, we have showed how many political prisoners are. So for example, before April 2017, before the, the last protest, mass protest started, there were 117 political prisoners. Monthly, if you see our statistics, there were 100 every month. They were not the same. There were 100, you know, with a, a political, uh, with a revolving door effect that I'm talking about. In July, because of protest, the number of political prisoners increased to 676. And we started saying that there were 676. Right now, after that, I started, we started uh, uh, sending the list of political prisoners to the OAS, to the Organization of American States, in order for them to certify the list and to verify the list, not for the government to say, where, where are the political prisoners? Well, they're here. So the OAS has a, has a list, so we have it here, so we have the names and everything. Well, right now, the government called us. Actually, they sent me a letter asking for the list of people that have been detained in a violent uh, actions or whatever. This is a list of political prisoners. So I answer the, the letter, I send another a letter um, saying, OK, here is the list of political prisoners. Actually, they used the list, and they went to all prison centers, some of the prison centers. Actually, the, the, the number of political prisoners have decreased to 342 is the, is the last one. So every week, they have decreased the number to about, in about, 11, 20, or whatever. So they, they have to go again <laughs> to the 100 uh, uh, you know, number. And this is important, because this is how you increase the political cost. This is how you do the, because the government, they, are not, they don't want to have uh, you know, 1,000 political prisoners. They don't want to have 600 political prisoners. Well, they don't want, it's not that they don't want to have it. They want to have it because it's an intimidation effect, so they don't want people to protest, so they, they want people to say, okay, if I go to protest, then I'm going to jail, so I prefer not to protest, or I'm, I'm being killed, or whatever. So they, they, they don't care about, about uh, incarcerating people, but they don't want the world to know that they have political prisoners. So, so they're the ones who are showing that. So that's why I was telling you about this map, 
because if a country in the world knows that the, the, map, that the, the, the map shows that they have 100 political prisoners, they will like, they will better not to have anyone. If nobody knows, for example, in Egypt, I was talking once to a human rights defender there, and I asked her, how many political prisoners do you have in Egypt? I'm talking about Egypt because Egypt is not, is not a socialist country. You know, it doesn't matter if you are socialist or capitalist or whatever, it doesn't matter. Political prisoners or repression can happen in a socialist country or in a capitalist country. And she told me, I don't know. I don't know, 10,000, 20,000? And she asked me and I said, we have that, 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 the number, specific number. And then I realized, okay, this is how you, uh, 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 this is a way, the methodology to release political prisoners or to, to stop repression or to decrease state repression. And well, that's why I think, I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but I, I think uh, that's, that's the best, the, the most important thing that actually we do. Thank you. Well, thanks for your question. So I just want to end on actually a quote from Robert F. Kennedy. Um, it reads, it's from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. So thank you both for your courage, and thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.